In this video, we're going to look at behaviorist approaches to psychology. Um, behaviorism, uh, broadly defined, is literally the uh, analysis of psychology at the level of behavior. Now, this is stemming from criticisms of earlier work by uh, Wundt and by Freud, uh, by the early behaviorists who suggested that looking at human experience from the perspective of introspection or through the lens of the unconscious mind isn't observable and it's not measurable, so therefore it's not scientific. Uh, so behaviorism was known as being the first attempt to uh, objectify psychology and to really set it on a course towards becoming a science. Now the basic premise of behaviorism is that behavior is the result of environmental factors and conditioning. Now this uh, essentially rejects um, any inbuilt predisposition that people might have. So it rejects any internal uh, cause of behavior and attributes behavior purely to the effect of the environment. Uh, J.B. Watson was uh, the founder of Behaviorist Thought and what he suggested was that if you gave him a dozen healthy infants and his own uh, kind of predefined environment within which to raise them, he could take any one of those at random and turn them into a doctor, a lawyer, an artist, a merchant thief, or even a beggar. And what this is suggesting is that um, he believed that if you could take any random individual and turn them into whatever you wanted them to be, then the cause of behavior is purely environmental. Now, as I've just said, uh, the kind of bedrock of behaviorist uh, thought is that behavior is driven by conditioning by the environment. The earliest uh, manifestation of this, or the earliest conceptualization of this, was classical conditioning, um, put forward initially by uh, Ivan Pavlov. Now, Ivan Pavlov's dogs experiment is one of the seminal experiments uh, within psychology. And essentially what he showed with this uh, paradigm was that you could take an unconditioned stimulus and pair it with a conditioned response. So for example, um, it's well known that dogs naturally and instinctively salivate at the sight or at the smell of food. It's a natural response, it's instinctual and they have no control over it. It's an unconditioned stimulus in the food, giving rise to an unconditioned response in the salivation. Now, along with that, you also know that uh, if you take a random dog and you uh, ring a tuning fork in the presence of that dog, typically you see no response. So there's no response between the dog and the tuning fork. However, when you pair a, tu a tuning fork with food, uh, what you saw was that because the food was present, the dog began to salivate. But because those two things are being paired, the dog begins to associate food with the sound of the tuning fork. So that after a series of exposures to this association, just hearing the tuning fork be, uh, be rung, uh, the dog begins to salivate. Um, so this then becomes a conditioned response to the conditioned stimulus of the tuning fork. You're pairing two stimuli together, one that is unconditioned and one that you want to be conditioned uh, in order to lead to a conditioned response. Now alongside this idea of classical conditioning, we have a newer version of conditioning called operant conditioning. Uh, this was put forward by uh, B.F. Skinner. Um, and what I'm gonna show you now is a very quick video of uh, a high profile psychological scientist Mazarin Banaji from Harvard University talking about the influence of B.F. Skinner on psychological science. Um, Mazarin Banaji in the Department of Psychology, Richard Clark Cabot Professor of Social Ethics. B.F. Skinner is, I would say, the 20th century's preeminent psychologist. And I say that given the comparison of Freud who many people might regard to be the much more prominent person. But to scientific psychologists, those who work in labs like I do, there is no question, there is no contest, it is B.F. Skinner. He started at Harvard early in his career. He was a graduate student here. He went away to the Midwest for 20 years and he came back in 1948 and remained here until his death. His main contribution uh, was twofold. First, in the form of an idea, the idea being that if psychology is to be a science, it cannot study anything that's not directly observable. 
So Skinner didn't deny the existence of the mind, but he really believed that if you wanted to be a real scientist, that you would never try to study the mind because that was a black box. You couldn't directly perceive it. What you could see directly was behavior. And this is the most important sort of concept that he came up with and designed equipment, boxes, recording equipment to measure an animal's responses in the face of something called reinforcement. So the idea is a very simple one. If I want to increase some behavior in you, let's say a positive behavior like helping, uh, what I need to do is make sure that I give you a reinforcer every time you do that behavior. Uh, a smile might be enough, a cookie maybe. He broke this important concept of how do we change people's behaviors? How do we shape them? And he was a true, I would say, American psychologist. He believed very much that who you came all wired up to be was much less important than what the world could do to you and shape you. Before Skinner, psychology relied on something called the method of introspection. You asked people to think about things and then talk about them. And what J.B. Watson, who influenced Skinner, and what Skinner did is to create a complete departure from that. And they said, there is no place in science for asking people questions and having them just tell us what's in their head. We have to measure. We have to measure this stuff so that we know objectively with the increase in number of reinforcing pellets that you give a rat, what is the exact shift in behavior? And it was that precision and the focus on objectivity that they brought to our science that has shaped it, I would say, in you know forever. And just as with any good idea, there are, again, newer good ideas that come and take their place. And that, of course, happened to Skinner. He was quite unhappy with the way in which psychology turned later in his life, where most of us are indeed cognitive psychologists. Now, in one sense or another, we study the mind. We're interested in how our brains work, how our minds work. We believe that, like Skinner, we have objective techniques to do that. So we're not introspectionists like the original psychologists were, but we no longer are like Skinner in the sense that we don't believe that we can't actually try to understand the mind in and of itself. Now in that video, what you saw was Banerjee talking about operant conditioning. The idea that you can increase or decrease behavior by either introducing a reinforcement or introducing some kind of punishment. Now there's positive and negative versions of both reinforcers and punishers. If you're trying to increase the chance of a behavior being enacted again, then you need to reinforce that in some way. If you're trying to stop behavior from taking place, then you would be punishing uh, that particular behavior. Now, if we just take reinforcement to begin with, um, if you are positively reinforcing something, then you're adding something nice when that behavior takes place. So for example, uh, if you want your children to wash your car, every time they wash their car, uh, you might give them a treat, you might give them some money or some sweets or something like that. Um, if you're trying to increase behavior um, in another way and you want to uh, not necessarily give someone something but you want to take something away to reinforce that then uh, you would be engaging in negative reinforcement. Now an example of this might be if you're trying to get your partner to wash the pots uh, or do the dishes, uh, you might be constantly kind of nagging them to, uh, to do this um, as soon as they do it, you withdraw uh, that nagging behavior. You're taking away something that they find aversive. And that is then uh, designed to encourage them to do the dishes uh, next time around. In terms of punishment, uh, again, we have positive and negative versions. If you're uh, positively punishing someone, then you're decreasing their behavior by adding something aversive to their environment. So for example, uh, I mean, the classic example would be if you're trying to get a child to stop behaving in a particular way, you might introduce a smack to them. Um, a negative reinforcement uh, might be something uh, like if you're trying to get uh, a child to stop uh, playing their game, for example, if you're trying to get them to do something else, uh, then you might remove a games console. You're taking away something nice from them. So again, the, the key uh, principle behind this is that reinforcement um, encourages a behavior happening again punishment stops the chances or reduces the chance of a behavior being enacted in the future positive means you're adding something negative means you're taking something away now the core of behaviorism um, as a method for studying psychology or for studying mental process is experimentation 
Now an experiment is uh, simply a design of a research study where you are uh, looking at the differences between uh, two different conditions potentially. So you're looking at causation. You're looking at the relationship between a particular behavior in one condition versus another. Now this distinguishes it from uh, correlational research because a correlation just looks at the relationship between uh, two different things. With an experiment, what you're doing is you're seeing whether something happens in one condition or under one set of conditions, but not under another set of conditions. Uh, the core tenets of uh, experimental research is that you can observe behavior, you can experimentally or operationally define what you're looking at, and you can test it using scientific methods. Um, now, what this means is that you need to have tightly defined variables. Um, so tightly defined uh, variables in terms of what you're looking at, what you're measuring, what would a successful um, enactment of that behavior actually look like. Um, but you're also tightly controlling your experimental conditions. So you're eliminating or reducing the chances of any extraneous or confounding variables from having an effect on your outcome. And by that, you can uh, properly tell whether or not it's the experimental manipulation that you are uh, introducing that's having an effect on behavior. Uh, behaviorism does have an effect in uh, psychological treatment, specifically uh, in relation to phobias. Um, recent advances in technology actually are, are leading to more behaviorally based treatments for phobias being introduced into mental health care. Uh, one such example is in uh, the use of virtual reality uh, for treating phobias. We'll just have a, look, a quick look at one example of this um, in the next video. <laughs> Now that example might seem quite uh, far-fetched maybe or quite extreme um, but the principles of behaviorism uh, are really at play in this so uh, the participant in that study or in that uh, video clip at the end said that it felt a little bit too much to go all in with that uh, one experience and it might be worth building up to that kind of experience. Now that's referred to as systematic desensitization. And these are the small moves that someone takes to move towards engaging with a, an object of their phobia. So for example, if someone's scared of spiders, you won't straight away kind of introduce them to a tarantula and ask them to hold it. You might get them be to begin with to look at a picture of spiders. You might get them to watch a video of spiders walking around. You then might introduce a spider into the room in a sealed box. And what you're slowly trying to do is to break down the programming that they've already had that leads to that phobic response to spiders. Um, what you're trying to do is to also retrain uh, those responses that they have. So to learn that they can be in the company of spiders or they can be at height and not have anything negative happen to them. If you can retrain that conditioned response to spiders or heights or to anything that someone might be scared of, 
um, then you can reduce the chance that they experience that phobic response in the presence of that object. Um, and that is really a case of conditioning in action and it's something that is quite widely used in behavioural treatments for uh, mental health conditions.